around that camera and strap in. It's, it's time, time for, for another, another episode, episode of, of Talk, Talk Chat, Chat Live. Live. Get ready for 60 minutes of wall-to-wall photography, including photo news and tips, along with your photography questions in real time. With answers from your host, Olympus visionary, Joe Edelman. Hey gang, welcome to episode number 218 of Talk Chat Live. This episode of Talk Chat is sponsored by Imaging USA, which is hosted by Professional Photographers of America. This year's Imaging USA will be streaming live and on demand so that photographers from all around the world can attend. I have a link to more info in the show notes, but stay tuned and I'll give you a breakdown of all the cool things they have planned and I'll tell you how you can attend for free right at home. Hey, look, already we have photographers checking in from all over the world. So please, if you haven't done so, be sure to check in, leave me a comment, let me know where you are in the world. It's always cool to see so many people from so many different countries tuning in to chat about their love of photography. I mean, already I've got, uh, let's see, Renee in Switzerland, Alan in Denmark, I've got Ajax in Texas, I've got Eric in Texas, Alvin in Virginia, we've got Robert in New Jersey, G. Phillips in San Diego, Margo in Atlanta, Sean in Connecticut, Mitch in Northern Ireland, Luis in Portugal, I've got Keith in France. How cool is that? Seriously, I hope that you're all healthy and safe, and of course, still practicing your social distancing. I've got a serious favor to ask of all of you. You see that thumbs up button down there? Please, click it. I'm going to work really hard to help you with your photography in the next 60 minutes. You have my word. It would help more people find my channel and talk chat if you would do me a solid and hit that thumbs up. And while you're down there, feel free to hit that share button to let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Facebook, Twitter, they're the fastest way to get the word out. You can hit that link or you can share this link that I'm going to put in the chat window right there. It's tog.chat slash live. So how can I help you? with your photography. I mean, you're here, you might as well learn something, right? Start posting your questions. I'll do my best to answer them all in the next 60 minutes. And we don't have a lot of questions lined up, so tonight's a good night to get your question or topic in. Please remember, this is a gear-free zone. We talk about the hows and the whys behind creating great images and marketing yourself as a photographer. That might include gear if it's a question about how to do something, but I'm not gonna tell you what your next camera or lens should be. And folks, please, I know it's fun to chat, but I'm going to ask you to save the chat for questions so that you don't miss anything important and so that I don't miss any of your questions and all the chat noise. Remember, we're here to learn. Quick reminder, I announced last week that Talk Chat is now available for download as a podcast every week. And I'll go ahead and I will share the link with you here in the chat so that you can check it out. Obviously, if you listen to the podcast, you don't get to see this every week, right? But if you, you know, like to be able to download and listen while you're commuting or running or editing, well, there you go. The show's available on iTunes, Google, Spotify, Amazon podcast, all the major podcast platforms. You've got the link, check it out. I post the podcast a few hours after the end of this live show each week. Now for tonight's TOG lesson, blinking. Stop blaming your subjects, gang. It's your fault. You're the one holding the camera. Nobody made you photograph the blink. So you got to take the blame. Now, look, blinking is a problem that every photographer deals with. And while it frustrates many, most photographers come up with little tricks to avoid the blinks. But even those tricks, they're not foolproof. And they usually don't account for the real reason that the blinks are happening in the first place. So right out of the box, I want to debunk a common misconception. This is important. When you are shooting with flash, it doesn't matter if we're talking speed light or studio strobes, the flash does not cause the blink that you photograph. That's not possible. It very likely does cause your subject to blink, but that blink happens after the shutter closes. 
So follow along. We're going to use some math here. And I hate math, so I'll keep it as simple as possible. We know that most speed lights and studio strobes have a flash duration of somewhere between one two thousandth of a second and one ten thousandth of a second, depending on the flash and the power setting that you're using at any given time. So when you're shooting with flash, that becomes your effective shutter speed. Even though most of the cameras today are designed to synchronize with flash at one two fiftieth of a second, they do that to accommodate the fact that when you press the button, the shutter opens, the flash fires, and then the shutter closes. That's why the flash duration is much faster than the shutter duration, right? So this means that if we go with the longest flash duration of one two thousandth of a second, the flash takes 0 0.0005 milliseconds. Now, in case you're wondering, a millisecond is a thousandth of a second. Reflexive eye blinks, they're the ones that are caused by the flash. They happen between 15 and 60 milliseconds after the flash occurs. The reason for that range is that there's a high level of individual differences amongst people. They're not all the same. So if the fastest blink happens 15 milliseconds after the flash, the flash will have ended at least 14.0005 milliseconds before the blink begins. So the flash is not the cause of the blink that you are photographing. And just so we're clear, the sound of your shutter is also not the cause of the blink that you are photographing for similar reasons. Now, before I tell you the actual cause, let's look at a few other facts that actually are helpful to understand. So we know that blinking is a reflex, which means that your body does it automatically. Of course, you can make yourself blink if you choose, but most of our blinking, it's reflexive. We do it subconsciously. Blinking serves a purpose. It lubricates and it cleans your eyes by spreading a cocktail of oils and mucus secretions over the surface of your eyes. Blinking also keeps your eyes safe by closing it to keep out the dust, the bright light, and foreign objects. Interestingly, babies and children only blink about two times per minute. By the time you reach adolescence, that increases to 14 to 17 times per minute. And it stays at that number for the rest of your life. Also, as humans, you blink more when you're talking or when you're nervous or if you're in pain. You blink less while you're reading or when you sense possible danger. So what causes the blinks that we catch in our photographs? And how do we prevent this? Fact is that some of those blinks that we catch are completely random. And there's absolutely nothing that you could have done. But most of them are a reflex. It is a reflex that is triggered by anticipation. When you have been repeatedly taking pictures of the same person, they will develop a classically conditioned response to your finger approaching the button. So their blink will actually be in response to your finger movement before you press the button. Even if they can't see your finger, if you tend to work and shoot with a certain rhythm, they can and will subconsciously pick up on that rhythm and blink in anticipation. But that's not all. A subject that is nervous or uncomfortable is going to blink more frequently, which further highlights the need to make your subject comfortable and highlights the need to communicate a lot while you're photographing them. So how are we going to minimize the amount of blinking that will potentially ruin our shots? Start by working very hard to keep your subject relaxed. Less stress means fewer blinks, period. Always put yourself in your subject's shoes, so to speak. They're human. 
They're not an object. Be talkative. Be friendly. Show empathy. Also, try to avoid super bright lighting. It not only increases blinking, but it causes squinting, which is not very flattering. And trust me, you should never talk to your subject about how much they're blinking. The minute you have that conversation, you make your subject hyper aware of it. And then they're sitting there or standing there concentrating on their blinks instead of relaxing and thinking happy thoughts. If you are photographing a subject with sensitive eyes, be sure to work your lighting accordingly. Don't use the brightest lights that you can find. Remember, empathy. Show compassion for their situation. Raise your ISO and use softer lighting. It's not that hard. If you're photographing someone who nervously anticipates your flash and blinks in anticipation, well, then you're going to have to work a bit harder. In this case, I like to use a tripod and a wireless remote control so that they can't see my finger. And I also make it a point to vary my timing so that I'm not predictable with my shooting patterns. Conversation is very important to help the person relax when we're doing this. I want them to essentially forget about the camera. The more that I can take the camera out of the equation, the less chance there is of them anticipating a shot due to nerves. Now, I know there are loads of articles and YouTube videos that recommend various solutions or tricks to overcome this. Unfortunately, they all, and I looked at a ton of them researching this, they all overlook the cause and the psychology behind the blinks. So here are a few of the examples that I found online. And to be fair, these will work occasionally, but not consistently. Absolutely not. And they don't solve the real problem. In fact, most of them actually create other problems. First one, tricking your subject. Telling them that you're going to count to three and then taking the picture on two. The problem with that is you might get one or two, maybe even three shots in where that works, but then they're on to you. Now you've misled the subject. Now you've made them hyper aware of something that you're doing as opposed to what they should be thinking about. And they figured you out, so they're going to go right back to anticipating what you're doing. And then they're going to be blinking at all weird times, trying to avoid you tricking them. Another one that you see a lot, telling your subject to count to three, but consciously blink on two. So, so now think about that, right? I had to think about that. I was like, okay, so wait, I'm the subject. You want me to count to three, but when I get to two, I should blink. So it's going to be one, two, three. Like, seriously? Try and do that. Try and do that as you sit there. All right, imagine a camera in your face. I want you to count to three, but you're going to blink on two. Your facial expression when the shutter goes off is going to be, I, I, I mean, come on, really? We're human. Another one, having the person keep their eyes closed and then on the count of three, open them when you take the picture. So now you've got a subject with their eyes closed wondering, all right, what's this weirdo doing while my eyes are closed? And then it's like, okay, one, two, three. Right? You expect the person to look completely natural when you've had their eyes closed and they open them. They're going to look just completely natural. What are you going to do? You're going to tell them, on the count of three, open your eyes and smile. There's that word, smile. It's a great way to get a less than genuine expression. Another one that I came across numerous times, using TTL pre-flash with the idea that they'll blink for the pre-flash not the actual flash, doesn't work, okay? First of all, the, the pre-flashes are not that bright. Secondly, that whole situation takes long enough. After the first one or two times that you do it, once again, they have figured it out. They're going to automatically blink on that last flash. It's just psychology. It's really just simple psychology. Using bounce flash is not the solution. Using bounce flash helps not blast the person with really bright light, 
but it's still a flash. It's still a trigger response. And Kirsten, oh my God, is not about the squinch. You want to make your subject look like an idiot? Tell them to squinch. You can quote Joe Edelman on that. Another one that I found, telling the person to have bright eyes. This is one that I came across a lot, and this one boggles my mind. Like, So I want you to imagine, I'm giving you this direction. So I want you to have really bright eyes, all right? Think of something that makes you smile with a little hint of surprise, kind of like a child doing something for the first time. Go ahead, process all that. Somebody just told you to do that. I want you to look natural and happy when you do that. Come on. What you're doing, folks, is you're misdirecting. You're giving the subject something else to do, and the problem with that is it may get you away from the blink a couple of times, but what it's not going to do is it's not going to give you natural and relaxed expressions, and it will not work for more than one or two shots. And believe me, there, there are many more of these tricks on the internet. Tricks are not reliable. Most of these tricks, as I mentioned, require you asking your subject to do something that has nothing to do with the intended emotion of the shot. So what you wind up with are expressions and body language that they're off. They're, they just don't connect. The solution is to put your subject at ease, period. Make a connection. Show empathy. Don't point out the blinking problem because it will only make it worse. If your subject is a serial blinker, use a tripod and a wireless release so that they can't anticipate the flash and then talk to them. Keep their attention away from the flash. And one last thought that I want to leave you with about the subject of blinking. So I'm going to go in the opposite direction here. Follow along. If you photograph enough people, you will eventually encounter, probably more than once, the subject who knows that they are a blinker. And they're afraid that they're gonna ruin your photos. So what happens is the minute you pick up your camera, they become stiff and they force their eyes open. So they're like, and worse yet, as you keep shooting, if you're paying attention, you will notice they're not blinking at all because they're afraid they're gonna mess up a shot and they look stoned in the pictures. So when I encounter a subject like this, and believe me, it's happened many times, I'll take a pause, and now I am gonna talk about the blinking, but this is a slightly different situation, so listen, because I'm gonna tell you exactly what I say to them. I tell them that I want them to blink naturally. I explain to them that it is completely okay if we get some blinks. Now, the challenge is that this person is already worried about blinking. And I've just told them to do something that is counterintuitive. So if I want them to go along with me and trust me and do what I'm asking, I have to tell them why. By telling them why, I eliminate their concerns and I make them a very willing collaborator. So I explain, and this is what I say to them, if I catch some blinks from time to time, I know that you are relaxed and I know that your facial expressions are relaxed because everybody blinks. I want to see those blinks. And also, if you don't blink, your eyes are going to dry out, especially if you wear contact lenses. And then your eyes are going to tear up, which will ruin the makeup. Plus, dry eyes will develop bloodshot lines really quickly verbatim, that's what I tell them. No subject ever wants a stiff facial expression or tears or messed up makeup or bloodshot eyes. So by taking a few extra moments to explain why, I've convinced them that I know what I'm talking about. And now they're very eager to try it my way because my way is actually easier and it requires a whole lot less effort on their part. So remember, nobody makes you press the button. Once you press the button, you can't be blaming your subject. A few blinks are good, but blowing the shot because of blinking, very bad. And it's also worth noting that you can't just master this and still seem to specialize in, or I should say, let me try that again. 
it's worth noting that if you just can't master this and you still seem to be the photographer that specializes in photographing blinks, try a quick search at Getty Images, the stock photo site. You'll find that they've got over 2,600 images of people blinking or Shutterstock has over 20,000 images of people blinking. So who knows? Maybe you can make a few bucks on the side selling those blinks as stock photos, right? Anyway, I hope you found this helpful and that it is giving you some ideas to help you improve your photography. And now for the important and interesting photo news of the week. Profoto announced a brand new $1,095 Speedlight, the A10. Yes, you heard that correctly. A $1,095 Speedlight. And it's basically the same as their A1X model, but they've added Bluetooth controls so that you can use it with your iPhone. Here's the thing, folks. This is a 76 watt second speed light with a round head. Did I mention that it sells for $1,095? Obviously, Profoto is never going to be sponsoring Joe Edelman, right? Look, by comparison, I can buy a Godox AD200 with 200 watt seconds, almost three times as much power for less than $300. And it comes with two light heads and has many more accessories available for it, which also sell at a lower price. Also, next in news, Adobe has finally announced that Photoshop will be getting a super cool sky replacement feature that lets you instantly swap out skies in your photos. The AI powered system, which is part of their new Adobe Sensei technology, will feature a selection of preset skies, but you can also choose your own sky photo from your own computer. You can also group your skies by collections to help organize them better. And if you're a control freak like me, this is the part that I like, the AI preserves every layer, every mask, and non-destructive adjustment so that you can easily fine tune things to your own liking. It's worth noting, since everybody knows about Skylum and the Luminar Sky Replacement, Adobe first teased the Sky Replacement feature at Adobe Max in 2016. But to their credit, Skylum beat them to market by replacing that Sky, or excuse me, by releasing the Sky Replacement feature in Luminar 4 in July of 2019. Adobe has promised us more details at the Adobe Max conference. It's coming up at the end of October. Also, the Japanese newspaper, Nikkei, which is the world's largest financial newspaper by circulation, published an article this week about Sony's first decade in the mirrorless market and the current trends in the camera industry. This article includes a surprising breakdown of camera shipments by Japanese brands in 2019. So this was the last year of the 8.66 million interchangeable lens cameras that were shipped in 2019. Only 46% of them were mirrorless. I would have expected much more, honestly. I didn't know. Canon leads the pack by a mile, followed by Nikon and then Sony. But if, if we look at just the mirrorless camera sales, Sony was in first place, followed very closely by Canon, but then a distant third is Fuji. Then comes Olympus, with Nikon trailing behind all of them. I'm honestly scared to see the results for 2020 because you know this has been a brutal year for the camera industry. Eric, thank you so much for the super chat. I really, really appreciate it. Also, last thing for you here in the news, I promised you more details about the upcoming Imaging USA, which will be happening January 17th through the 19th. And while that sounds like a long time away, it's less than four months. Imaging USA is the world's largest photography convention and expo. And in 2021, you can experience its three days of live education and on-demand classes right from wherever you are. It promises to be the same great energy of an in-person event brought to you in a whole new way. And I can tell you for a fact, this is not part of my script for tonight. I was actually on the phone with them today working on planning for this event that's coming up in January. They are determined to put on a world-class event online. So this is going to be different than anything you have attended. This Imaging USA will include everything that you've come to expect and then some. PPA, Professional Photographers of America, who hosts Imaging USA, has dubbed this the unconventional convention. And because of the pandemic, of course, they've decided to move the event online this year and truly make it a worldwide event. It will still include the opening and closing keynote speakers, the educational programs, including the pre-conference classes, one of which will be taught by yours truly. 
The Imaging USA Expo, which is the trade show, will still happen virtually. Also, the International Photographic Competition Exhibit, the Award and Degree Ceremony, the Grand Imaging Awards, and even the social activities will still occur online. And here's the amazing part. PPA has dropped the registration fee to $59 for a three-day all-access pass, regardless if you are a member or not. I'll tell you straight up, you, you're not going to find a program with better learning experiences than this one. And for $59, don't miss it. If you aren't already a PPA member, I would encourage you to join because then the $59 registration fee is waived. In fact, as a new member, you will be able to attend Imaging USA 2021 online for free and Imaging USA 2022 in person also for free. I have links to the Imaging USA website and also a link for new members to join PPA for $25 off in the show notes below. Okay, that's it for the news. That's it for our lesson. Let's get into the questions. How can I help you improve your photography? I have one question tonight that came in from my Facebook groups. And if you haven't joined the groups yet, come on, it doesn't cost anything. The links are in the show notes below. So that question, let me just switch my screen over here. That question comes from Keith Taylor, all the way from France. And his question is, I've just upgraded from the OMD EM1 Mark I to an OMD EM1 Mark II. Congratulations, Keith. I'm running Adobe Lightroom 5 because I don't like the idea of subscriptions and losing access to my photos if I had to stop paying. My problem is that I can no longer open the raw files. Is there a workaround? For example, a simple program that will convert them to the DNG format, or must I make the decision to buy Capture One or rent Lightroom? Okay, Keith. So there's a couple things to unpack here, Keith, but I think we can find you a decent solution. So number one, um, you don't lose your photos unless you choose to only use Adobe's online storage. Most photographers today either have, you know, external hard drives on their computers, plus they're using cloud services like Dropbox or Google Drive or any number of other online storage services, even, you know, Apple iCloud, uh, Backblaze, uh, Amazon Web Services, things like that. So they're not holding your photos hostage. Uh, myself, it were, if it were up to me, and I'm not a Lightroom user, so full disclosure, right? But I, I would not rely only on Adobe for web storage. Uh, there have been quite a few examples in the last few months. Canon had a problem where people lost a lot of images. Um, Adobe had a problem where they cost people images that were you know, in their, their archives and that. You, you never want to have all of your stuff in one place. So, so that in and of itself should not become an issue. Now, with regards to the fact that you can't open the raw files, the workaround, I'm not positive, but I'm going to give you something to check. And that is the reason why you can't, oh, I can tell you for a fact why you can't open the, wrong fi the raw files. I'm, my challenge is I don't know if you're going to be able to update it as far as you need to, but I think you can. The fact that the raw files won't open simply means that you do not have the latest camera raw plugin on your computer. Right? So Lightroom itself is not what opens the files. It's the Camera Raw plugin that opens the files. And it's actually a separate piece of software that gets updated independently of Lightroom. So that's what you need to check, first of all. Is check your updates on those two pieces of software and make sure that you have got the most current version of the Camera Raw plugin. I am reasonably sure that even though you're running Lightroom 5, which is a standalone Lightroom, you should be able to update the Camera Raw plugin. If you are not, if I'm wrong, and I'm telling you up front, I may be, but I don't think so. If I'm wrong, though, then uh, unfortunately, I do not know of a piece of software. What I would suggest that you could do would be to look at something like GIMP or Darktable, which are both um, you know, open source, free to inexpensive pieces of software that you could use to do conversions on your files. Um, that's where I would, would begin. Certainly if what's driving this Keith is, you know, strictly budget. In other words, if you, if you can't afford this subscription service, 
then obviously that's completely understandable and you do what you have to do. Um, in terms of, you know, is the subscription service good or bad or that kind of stuff, you know, I, I, I won't have the debate, but I'm, I'm of the mindset that the Adobe subscription service is actually a really good deal. Um, you know, I know a lot of photographers dislike it, but the thing you have to un understand is that number one, we want Adobe to stay in business. And number two, Adobe does reward us with some outstanding technology. As I mentioned uh, tonight, um, I, you know, we've got the, the AI tools that are coming out and things like that. So I find it to be valuable. And here we've got, see, we've got some good crowdsourcing going on. So Ken, yes, the Adobe DNG converter, forgot all about that. And Album uh, is pointing out that GIMP doesn't open raw. So that solves that problem, but Darktable will do it. So, so there are some end arounds there, Keith, but try to update your camera raw plugin first. Uh, I can tell you for a fact, that's the piece that actually opens the file. And I really do believe you'll be able to update the camera raw plugin. So try that first. Okay. All right, gang. Uh, let's see what we got here for questions. I saw a couple come in early and let's see, Steve, when you look back at the current year and realize you haven't accomplished your goals, how do you not let it get you down? Um, that depends, Steve. Um, I rarely accomplish all of my goals uh, in part because I just always have goals and things that I'm after that, you know, I, I essentially aim really high. Um, I'm a big believer of, you know, aim high and, you know, reach for the stars, aim low, and you're guaranteed to, you know, miss like pretty much. And I know I didn't get that quote right, but you get the gist. Um, so, I mean, for me, if I have busted my butt and had successes and, and, you know, been productive, even though I didn't get everything done, I am constructive in, in that review in the sense that, okay, you know, let's take a look at the things that I didn't get done because there's reasons why. Some of them may have been simply that in real time, I just didn't prioritize them enough. So that's a great time to kind of review and say, should I be prioritizing them more? Maybe they actually weren't worth prioritizing. But um, the only time I'm going to really be tough on myself is if I was just kind of goofing off. And at least so far, knock on wood, I've got enough energy that I don't really goof off that much. So, um, you know, I, I think for the sake of one's own mental health, regardless, you've, you've got to kind of stay positive about it. Uh, I think it's always good to do, you know, some self-reflection when the end of the year comes to look at what's been done and what's been accomplished. And this year, I will tell all of you, um, maybe it's generational. Maybe it's because I'm a boomer. Maybe it's just because I'm a hard ass. But I don't want to hear all this crap come, you know, December, like, Oh, you know, 2020 was such a horrible year. I didn't get to accomplish anything I wanted to do in photography, and it was all 2020's fault. Look, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm of the mindset. I went into March with an amazing year lined up. Amazing year. I was going to make a ton of money, and it all went away in two weeks. Gone. Like, erased. I pissed it back and, you know, just watched a lot of Netflix and said, man, this sucks. But I didn't. I pivoted. I learned new technology. I kept moving forward. I changed my business model. I, you know, am and, and continuing to look at how can I grow as a person, as a photographer, as a businessman, because I believe that that's what we should all be doing. So, yeah, a lot of really sucky stuff happened this year. And I'm pretty sure it's not done, right? But, you know, I, I refuse to just be a victim to it. Uh, if I'm going to be a victim, I'm going to be a victim on my terms, meaning, you know, I'm going to go down fighting, right? That's that's kind of how, how I look at it, which I get it. It's not for everybody, but um, Steve, I hope that helps, okay? All right, scrolling on down here. What was the next one I had in? Um, let's see. Uh, where are we at? Oh, there's all the hellos. Okay, from Adam. Uh, what ND and polarizing filter do you recommend for slow shutter uh, landscape slash beach photography? Um, 
Honestly, Adam, I don't recommend a filter. I recommend a camera, but that's because I'm an Olympus shooter. You know, I would get the EM1X or the EM1 Mark III, and, you know, then I can do all that kind of stuff without the filters. Um, I don't own any neutral density filters uh, just because I don't have that much of a need for them. I do use polarizers occasionally. Um, and I don't go overboard in terms of, you know, the cost. I have the high-end Tiffin ones. Uh, and I have one of the B and W ones, uh, but they're all, you know, they're all the thin glass, the ultra high def, whatever, but certainly not the most expensive of filters that are available. Um, so your answer is really going to depend number one on your budget. Uh, cause unfortunately that's just the reality, neutral density filters, especially variable new, uh, ND filters, uh, and polarizing filters, they can get really pricey, really fast. If you're going to go for like super high quality. So um, part of your decision is going to be based upon price. Part of your decision is going to be based upon uh, how much you're really going to use them. You know, if it's something you're going to use a couple times, I don't know that I'd go spend in like top dollar, to be honest. Um, you know, if you're going to use it a lot and, and it's going to be like a primary part of your, your kit and your shooting style and technique. Um, yeah, but I will say that uh, recently... I'm seeing a lot of people trying the whole slow exposure thing with polarizers and neutral density filters on the beach with the water and all that, meaning it's a trend. Trends are cheap. So I'm not telling you, oh, don't do it or don't try it. No, but I am telling you if, if you're curiously wanting to try this because you're seeing it and you think, hey, it's really cool, then I would start out with, some inexpensive ND filters and inexpensive polarizers and experiment and get a feel for it and um, teach yourself how to do it, how to accomplish it. And then only spend for the pricier ones because they are considerably pricier when you reach a point where you realize that those inexpensive NDs or polarizers are actually holding you back from the quality that you want to achieve. But in, in many, many cases, you're not going to see a difference. You're just not, right? So uh, that would be my approach. I hope that helps, okay? And let's see here. Where are we at? Um, Cooley Priestley, is there a way of making a fake pumpkin prop for newborns? Um, ye, probably. Cooley, are you talking about, like, the idea of being able to, like... Um, put like the newborn in the prop or something is, is like is that, that what you mean? Um, so I, I, I would be shocked if there's not something like, um, on, um, you know, the internet, like Pinterest or, you know, um, any of that kind of thing. In fact, um, yeah, coolly, I gotta be honest with you, man. So I, I'm just Googling here while we're, we're talking. Uh, or while I'm talking and answering a question, and I just found a boatload of results. So, um, yeah, my answer to you would be, I don't know of anything specifically. However, uh, there's this website. It's called Google. It's spelled G-O-O-G-L-E. You can check it out. It's really cool. Uh, yeah, I just found a bunch of stuff. So I, I, would, I would start there, okay? All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, James. Book recommendations, looking for inspiration while still tied down uh, with this epidemic. Penn, Walker, Newton, anything alternative? Well, actually, so <laughs> true story. I, I'll, I'll own this. You know, you guys always like it when I tell you weird things about me. So I'll own this. I hate to read. It's a patience thing. I can read great. In fact, the first 20 minutes of Talk Chat tonight, I read to you. Okay, it's scripted. I write it, I script it. But I have no problem reading, but reading for leisure, so many things I'd much rather do. So I'm the kind of guy that usually, um, if uh, there's a book and I want to read it, I will get it as an audible book or, you know, something like that. Um, true story, when the Steve Jobs biography came out not long after he passed away, I pre-ordered it because I was really excited to read the biography. I pre-ordered it. And then like a week before the book came out, they announced that they sold the rights to make a movie. I never read the book. I was like, yeah, I'll wait for the movie. <laughs> and I would see the movie. So anyway, that being said, 
Um, here's a book that literally, so this is a very rare purchase for me. That's basically why I'm, I'm explaining that, uh, James, this is a book that just arrived today. Okay. Uh, from Amazon. So I have not even really cracked it open yet. It is a book about Irving Goffman. Before you all run out, he is not a photographer. Some of you may recognize this photo. It's a very fo famous photo by the New York street photographer who was better known as Ouija. Okay. But this is not a photography book. This is actually, uh, the subtitle here is The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. This is a book about psychology in terms of how people perceive themselves and how people choose to present themselves. From the research that I've been doing recently, and I stumbled on this gentleman, and this gentleman, um, in fact, this particular book was originally put into print in, uh, when, let's see, uh, well, actually, it doesn't say on the back. I thought it would say on the back. Um, this book's been around for a while. I want to say it's back in the 60s. This book came out, possibly the 50s even. Uh, the photograph on the cover is from the 1940s. 1959 is when this book was written, right? Um, but um, there is some outstanding kind of social psychology information in here for somebody that photographs people, interacts with people and things like that great understanding. So I'm actually very excited to dig into this. Uh, and along the way, you guys will inevitably um, hear some some mentions of things and tidbits that, uh, that I've picked up in here. But, um, you know, beyond that, um, James, it, it, it's kind of tough with books. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan. So my thing, and I've, I've talked about this before. So this is just, you know, this is just the world according to Joe, right? There's no science behind this. There's, there's no right or wrong. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of looking at other people's photography. And the reason is, number one, it's really easy to make me feel inadequate, feel jealous, because I didn't, I didn't get to do those things, right? I, I enjoy the doing. Um, so, you know, if you're going to apply some, some discipline to looking at other people's work, I think that, yes, then there's some value that can be you know, brought out of it, As, especially um, when you, you know, talk about some of the photographers that you mentioned, you know, Penn, Walker, Newton, that type of thing. Um, but I would at least suggest don't select picture books of their work. Try to look for books and publications that have interviews with them that really dig into their process and more importantly, their thought process. Um, the more that you do learn about the thought process and the working values of photographers like those that you mentioned, honestly, the more freeing it becomes and the more empowering it is because you realize that most of them weren't tied down by all of this bullshit about, excuse my French, but about rules and, and about you have to do this or you have to do that. They, they didn't deal with any of that crap. One, they didn't care. Two, it helped that they didn't have social media. But three, that just was not a part of their thought process, period. So, so yeah, I would at least encourage you, if you're going to go that route, looking for inspiration, make sure you're, you're getting books that, that really get into their workflow and their thought process and their mentality. Uh, and even books that, that teach you a little bit about their life and their lifestyle. Because you, the more you read about that, you will quickly understand how that impact their work. You know, sometimes when we just take the work at face value and we look at the technical details that are there, it doesn't really give us understanding. And as, as you guys see with the things that I teach, there's so much more to photography than photography. Think about that, right? It just is, especially if you're going to photograph people. There is so much more to photography than just the photography. So to me, that's where uh, the, the real, you know, learning is, Okay. Here, Mitch has a recommendation here. Mitch, uh, if I can chime in with a photography-related book recommendation, I'd strongly suggest On Being a Photographer by David Hearn. Uh, not a photo book and very much not uh, the approach to photography. Cool. Mitch, you're a regular. I'll take your word for it, and I will look it up afterwards. I've, I'm not familiar with that photographer's name, um, but I like the sound of what they're trying to present there. So, uh, folks, you can, you can kind of check that out. All right. 
And let's see here. Uh, scrolling on down. Um, whoop, I mean, excuse me, scrolling back up to where I was. Let me find that last question. So there's Adams. Um, let's see, Renee, when you shoot TTL, the measuring flash will uh, make people blink. Yes, it will just make people blink multiple times. And um, even if you get lucky in the first one or two times, it doesn't close a blink while your shutter's open. It will because they'll quickly figure out what's what's happening. People pick up on those those things very, very quickly. And, and then it kind of becomes uh, ineffective in terms of um, in terms of eliminating the, the blink problem. OK. All right. Let's see where are we at here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Devorator 72. Isn't this a gear free zone? Absolutely, man. We don't talk about what's the best camera. OK. Photography doesn't exist without gear. I talk about the kind of gear that's going to help you make a difference in, in what you do. And I talk about the stuff that people really should pay attention to when we want to talk about what camera company is going to go out of business and who's doing this and who's doing that. So, so yeah, the point is we don't have any debates over who's better, Sony, Canon, or Nikon, or any of that kind of crap. Um, that's, that's just not going to be a part of the show. Okay? So uh let's see here um and patrick do i have any tips for optimizing a photographer's website seo especially uh for those templates that only showcase images you're not going to optimize those templates uh patrick for two reasons number one most of them aren't built even though they in their marketing they say oh they're you know seo todd thank you so much for the super chat man i appreciate it um patrick most of those Companies, even though they say, oh, yes, we're, you know, optimized for SEO and they give you the ability to put SEO stuff in, um, it's kind of pointless, meaning you have to actually ignore all that crap and simply go and read what Google tells you. Not a Google search, but I mean Google, right? Google is very forthcoming in terms of what they want. They don't, they don't tell you what the algorithm is, obviously. But they are very forthcoming in terms of what they want in order to have good SEO. And pictures only ain't going to do it, right? And all those tags that you put in, description, you know, the metadata, uh, metadata the title tags, all that stuff, that ain't going to do it either. They want text on a page, right? That's what they want. They want text on a page. So um, the way that you optimize a website for SEO is to uh, have text on a page and when I say text on a page, I don't mean two sentences, three sentences. I don't mean an about, you know, that has, uh, you know, 50 words to it. I'm talking like 300 words minimum, better yet, about 1,800 words, okay? You do that, then you're going to get Google to pay attention. And that doesn't still guarantee you great placement, but that's a step in the right direction, you know, in, in terms of doing that. So, um I would be the first to tell you, and, and, and Patrick, obviously, I know that you're doing a lot of commercial work and advertising work and things like that. One of the things that you need to understand is that your clients, the ones that you want, they're going to hire you to do the really awesome graphic product and commercial images that you're doing. I'm sorry, but even in Europe where you are, Adam, thank you so much for the super chat, man. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. Even in Europe where you are, Patrick, they're not going to Google to say, I need to find a photographer. They're just not. So I would actually propose to you, Adam, or Patrick, excuse me, and I would argue that you should never completely ignore SEO, but at the same time, don't stress over it because it is ultimately not going to make a difference for the work that you are doing. You are definitely headed into an arena where your challenge is the clients that you want to hire you, they already have photographers. Right? So... It doesn't matter how good you are. What you're battling against is you're battling against existing relationships. And why is an existing relationship such a big deal? Well, one, there's trust. That's the big one, right? If I'm an advertiser and I've worked with a photographer multiple times over, he or she may not even be the best photographer that's out there. But if they always deliver what I want, the way I want it, if my boss is happy with what they deliver, if they always meet the prices, they don't mess me around on billing or expenses or anything like that. I am happy. So I don't really want to deal with anybody else because anybody else, no matter how amazing your portfolio is, 
you're still a wild card. I don't know you. I don't know if I can trust you. I don't know if you have my back. Right? So the challenge is in those situations, the way you're going to really market yourself and break in, it's about relationships. And oftentimes the relationships you're going to create are going to be nothing more than ongoing email and or messaging exchanges that could last months, a year, years. It's just creating an awareness so that these people know about you, waiting for the day when the photographer they're currently using retires or for, for when the photographer that they're currently using is unfortunately sick and there's a job scheduled and they need to have that job done on time. Waiting for the time that they have a project that's so big that that photographer can't handle it by themselves. And then they're going to reach out to you and that then becomes your foot in the door. But when you're dealing with companies, corporations, unfortunately, it's never about who's best. Well, I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase that, please. It's never just about who's best. It is unfortunately about a lot of intangibles. So you need to start with a marketing plan that really is about making connections with these companies. For the types of companies you're looking at, Patrick, as expensive as it is, I would consider uh, doing a one-year subscription to LinkedIn Premium. This is where you're going to find these people. And uh, being a LinkedIn Premium member, which is about $560 US, um, it gives you full access to be able to contact anyone that is in LinkedIn. And anyone who is the head of a company or in a C-level position or a marketing director or marketing manager position, they've got a LinkedIn profile for sure. So uh, for the type of work that you're looking to do, it's, it's definitely money well, well spent, okay? Um, Steve Wilking, I'm rethinking my New Year's resolution. I want production rather than excuse as well. Yeah, let's face it. I mean, New Year's resolutions really, at the end of the day, statistically, they, they don't work. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that instead of New Year's resolutions, we, we just need to have values that we maintain and they should drive us all year round, right? So, um, all right, let's see. Scrolling on down here. From uh, German, I want to add rim light to my subject. Is there a particular size and brand of strip box that you would uh, recommend? I mainly shoot corporate headshots and products. So um, German, in terms of size and brand, let me do that last. Let me just point out one other thing to you first, just to consider. You can do really effective rim lighting for headshots and products with just a speed light head, you know, like a Fresnel head. Um, because all you're trying to do is, you know, kind of put a little bit of rim in. So you don't necessarily, like, to be perfectly honest, like this light back here, which is a, a 20, um, was it a 26 inch or 60 centimeter uh, round soft box? It's just there because it looks cool. I could create this same rim light with uh, a single flash head, right? Or even like an LED light that is that small. I could create the same kind of rim light. Um, so I, I will say to you, you don't necessarily have to go the route of a modifier just for a rim, right? Now, if you want to be able to be a little bit more versatile and if you're sometimes dealing with situations where you can't get that rim placed exactly where you want it, then indeed, modifier is helpful. And that being the case, I would consider, uh, for me, generally a 12-inch, um, you know, width. Um, the height, maybe 36 inches. It really depends on how much stuff you're willing to travel with, etc. cetera. Uh, I personally am a fan of the Photoflex um, uh, modifiers and also the Photix, P H O T I X, Photix uh, Rajas. Uh, so I would look at you know either one of those. Photoflex, if it if it's going to stay um, uh, in the studio and you're not going to like take it down, put it back together again, and travel with it. Photix Rajas, if you're going to travel, they're fine in the studio too. But if you're going to take them and collapse them and and set them up again and all that kind of stuff, uh, I much prefer the way the Rajas are are designed. Okay. All right, so um, Duke, 
Joe, I've been able to get some nice paying shoots, but it's been with people that want different things, which is good. But how do I get my style out there? Uh, well, Duke, you know, I, I think you're, I'm sorry to say, I think you're approaching it the wrong way. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that um, getting your style out there, you need to understand that nobody cares about your style. You care about your style. Even the way you worded your question, it's clearly important to you. You feel like it's, um, it's not being valued. But when clients hire you, they don't care about your style. They look at your pictures and they say, okay, I like that. Or they come to you with an idea and say, well, I know that you do this, but I like this. And then you have a choice. Either copy what they're showing you or say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Because I do this. But they don't care about your style. So the way that you accomplish what you want, you got to change your thinking a little bit. And I'm not trying to be mean or to be a jerk. So I'm making a generalized statement. But that indicates to me that your style is not good enough yet. The way you get people to want your style is to make your work so good that people look at it and say, oh my God, I've got to have that. I'm literally, I'm sorry, but that, that's how it's done. That's it. So maybe your style isn't completely fleshed out, developed yet. Maybe you have not mastered it to a point yet where you're creating the demand. So that's your challenge is to get your work to a point where people recognize it and demand it. Then you'll be able to make money shooting your style. Okay. Uh, where are we at here? G. Phillips. I tethered a Lightroom in the studio. The latest version is faster, but still slow enough to be irritating. Yes. And your opinion is Capture One a better tethering, op tethering option? Uh, like 3 million percent. Yeah, I, I, it simply is. Um, I have heard recently, I have not tried it. I have heard recently that Lightroom is getting a little bit better in terms of the speed, but indeed it's still brutal. Um, and I'm just not a fan of Lightroom, period. So... Uh, I love Adobe products. I swear by Photoshop. So I'm not trashing Adobe. I'm just not a Lightroom guy. Uh, Capture One though, yes. And uh, G. Phillips, especially if you photograph people like I do, uh, the skin tone and the processing tools in Capture One, sweet. Really, really sweet. However, and of course you can buy it outright or there's a subscription plan just like there is you know, with, with Lightroom and Photoshop. Here's the thing. Please understand that um, Capture One has a learning curve pretty substantial learning curve. It is a pretty heavy duty piece of software. So I'm not saying that to discourage you or to talk you out of it. I just don't want you going in blind, right? Uh, you'll find some similarities to controls and naming things, you know, to Lightroom, but it's got a learning curve. So you need to, if you're going to make that change, you need to be willing to go through the learning curve if you really want to take advantage of what the software can do for you, okay? Uh, Duke M, I see your challenge accepted. Thank you. Now I'm awesome. I'm glad that it's a challenge and I'm glad that you're willing to take it because believe me, I promise you that's the key. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, GG. The other day I was taking photos with an EM1 Mark III and all of a sudden it wouldn't focus. <gasps> the front clutch was on auto, but still couldn't fire. What was I doing wrong? If I was doing anything wrong, gosh, GG, without having the camera in my hands and seeing exactly what you did unfortunately i have no idea um you know i would recommend that you go back to the manual go through the steps um and then if you're still having a problem at that point i would strongly encourage you to uh, reach out to olympus customer support uh they're very good they'll be able to walk you through it help you out with what's going on but um there's based on your description there's any number of things that could go wrong and none of them actually involve the camera having a problem it's they're all user error um so it's just a matter of kind of troubleshooting and going through you know all of those things okay so um all right let's see be me joe any advice on uh the best places to get a used lens without getting ripped off uh, i mean be me honestly the the ideal scenario is any place where you're able to have that lens in your hand before you hand over the money, which means you could make a purchase on Facebook or, you know, anything like that. But ideally, go to your local camera retailers. So if you are in an area where you have a local camera store, they've got used equipment. Uh, I would start there because that way you're able to walk in, 
there's a person that's going to stand across the counter who also, you know, has a vested interest in your success with that lens because they want you to come back and they want you to do business there again. Um, if you don't have access to a camera store in your area, um, certainly B&H and Adorama uh, are reputable in that regard. Sometimes you'll hear that they're a little tough to deal with with service issues, but they're very reputable companies or a company that specializes in um, used gear is Key Photo. Uh, it's K-E-H. Google them, check them out. You will find that they have tons of used stuff and a great, great reputation. Okay. All right. Um, it's seven o'clock, but we're close to the end. So let's get these last couple. All right. And then we'll be good to go. Um, let's see. Todd Strong. Speaking of relationships, I shot candidates at a farmer's market last year, uh, talked to a couple of the vendors, went back this year. One remembered me. I took a shot, sent it, just called. Um, he just called the shot, um, shot his business. Let's see. Uh, okay. There we go. Make friends wherever you go. If you can take a good shot and email it, you never know what you'll get. Excited to get this shit going. So first of all, that's awesome, Todd. Congratulations. Secondly, for all of you, I mean, there's a, there's a great lesson in here, which honestly, it's not even a business lesson. It is a great business lesson, but it's kind of a human lesson. It is so easy, so easy to share images in today's world. And I don't just mean sticking on Facebook and tag somebody. I mean, actually take, what's it take? 30 seconds. 30 seconds to get somebody's email address, type in email, attach the file and say, I thought you might like to see this. It was really great to meet you. I appreciate you posing for this picture or I appreciate you letting me photograph your store. Whatever the circumstance is, share the photo. Folks, people photography, it's a relationship game. If you don't want to have relationships with people, Go shoot macro or wildlife or animals. The animals really don't mind if you don't have relationships with them. But people, it's a relationship game. That's how you get great photos. So in this case, you know, not only did this, you know, these conversations that Todd have when he went to this farmer market, they gave him access, but now it's also turned into business because he established relationships and he followed through on those relationships. So Todd, good for you. I'll look forward to, uh, Look forward to seeing the outcome. All right. Eric chimed in here. Key is great. Yes, I, I know a couple of folks from Key and they are awesome and they've got an amazing reputation when it comes to, to use gear. 702 and I'm done. I'm caught up. As always, gang, you're amazing. Thank you for hanging out. I hope that I was able to give you some information tonight that you can go out and put to good use. Okay. Um, again, a quick thank you. Uh, and special thanks to Imaging USA and the Professional Photographers of America for sponsoring tonight's episode. Remember, in the description, there's a link that will get you $25 off your new membership. And don't forget to block out January 17th through the 19th for Imaging USA right at home, live and on demand. As always, gang, seriously, thank you for tuning in and for a great night of chatting about all things photography. And please remember these words. Thanks for watching another live episode of Tog Chat. Now, pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot is your next shot. So keep learning, keep thinking, and keep shooting. Adios.